You are the children of the light, children of the day, writes St. Paul to the Christians in Thessalonica and writes the word God to us today. You are the children of the light, the children of the day. God, brothers and sisters, has brought you out of darkness and into his glorious light. So, be what you are, children of the light. I could just sit down and let it be at that, because that's really what I want you to lay hold of this morning. Look at the beginning of Thessalonians. Um, the message is that actually comes from Paul, Silas, and Timothy, a little team working together in the gospel, bringing this message from the Lord to these Christians in the town of Thessalonica. You are the children of the light, children of the day. And this is the message from the ministry leadership team of this church to you this morning. Be what you are. Be children of the light. It goes on to say, Paul goes on to write, encourage one another and build each other up as in fact you are doing. Are you doing that? Building each other up? We're learning to do it. That's what Paul is saying. Now, when did somebody last build you up? You can just think about when that was. Who was that? Do you need building up? I do. I love it when people send me messages that build me up. I need it, actually. If I didn't have any, I don't know where I'd go. Beep, be. Who last built you up, and how did they do it? What did they say? Was it a text message, a kind little word in a corner? Whatever, whatever it was. When did somebody last build you up? And last Sunday's message, it came from uh, that lovely little black lady with fire on her lips, little Freda. Her message was um, completely about building you up and me up. And I said... Um, you know, every morning now, when I get up in, with Margaret and wake up in the morning, look in the mirror that happens to be a, a wall a crop in front of us, instead of thinking, oh, that old 63-year-old man, and then we have a giggle together, I say, no, no, yes, wearing out, but made in the image of God. Yeah? Don't look so perplexed. That's what I went home with from Frida last week. A message that built me up. This is my message to you this morning. You are children of the light. Be what you are. Okay? I'm not going to get you to sing this little light of yours, let it shine. <laughs> we could do that. But what we are going to do now, if I can manage to get you to do this, is to turn to each other, people behind and before. You may have to get up and walk around a tiny bit and say, you are a child of the light. Be what you are. Do you want to just do that? You are a child of the light. Andrew, you are a child of the light. <laughs> Thank you. Be what you are. Nigel, you are a child of the light. Be what you are. And I apologize to you for the last five and a half years, but being somewhat heavy in my talks. Uh, as you will have heard, that these words of Scripture have certainly got a challenging, heavy bit to it. But if we miss this bit, if we miss what the New Testament proclaims again and again, that we are children of the light, we miss everything, and we just go home grumpy, you know? Yeah? Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but remember, he also said, you are the light of the world. Yeah, let your light shine. Don't put it under a bushel. Good. You might say, in other places of Scripture, we read, 
put on Christ, put on Jesus, dress up as though you were Jesus. Last Sunday, I put on Brother Lowe's uh, African gown costume, the beautiful blue gown. It fit perfectly. And do you know, it really made me feel different. Most of the time, I'm a rather serious Englishman, right? And I, I just loved being embarrassed. I just loved dressing up, pretending to be Brother Lowe last week. I want a bit of the, I want of the bit of the Nigerian spirit to rub off on me. I really do, and it helped me dressing up in that way. Um, and the scriptures say, "Put on Jesus, dress up as Jesus." You know, you go to the doctor's surgery. I was in the dentist with the dentist yesterday, and uh, they have special uniform on to remind you and to remind themselves that they're dentists. You were around and about the town yesterday. Uh, you will have noticed a very large police presence. Police is on horseback because of the um, EDL who are in town. They need to remind themselves who they are and what their job is by putting on police costumes. Yes? The army do the same. Um, you need to get ready, and you need to have your uniform on as a child of the light. It may not be. I don't put on a vicar's costume, do I? Only, you know. But uh, you need to dress up express the fact that you are a child of the light. Good. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 to 4, we read, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, you do, I do not need, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the, Lord, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come upon them suddenly and labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. Be ready for the day of the Lord. The day will come suddenly. That's the earlier bit of the text. And in Zephaniah, that first reading we had, verse 7a, we read, Be silent before the Lord, Sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. And then in verse uh, 15, we read, The day of the Lord will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. I sensed about six months ago that we at Christchurch needed a new team. And I was called it, we called it a ministry leadership team. I sensed that we needed a team that would be like the spiritual backbone of our church. With no other agenda other than to become ever more fully a spiritual backbone of our church. And in the last two meetings that we've had, we've been looking at how a community of faith like ours handles a crisis, handles the day of the Lord, if you like, when it comes. How do we prepare for a crisis? And we went from Moses, how does Moses prepare? We went to Daniel, we went to King David, we went to Paul, and finally to Jesus. And we looked at all these scriptures, trying to discern from the body of the text of the, the scriptures how God Almighty prepares his people for difficult times, for the day of the Lord, when it comes. How does it done? Remember Jesus' words about the wise man, these words that sum up the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. The wise man is the one who knows that the storm's going to come. The winds are going to blow. The waters are going to rise up in huge destructive power. And the wise man, knowing that day is coming, builds his house on the rock. It's a foolish one that doesn't prepare and just makes a fancy house, looks cool on the surface, but actually will collapse the moment the difficult times come. Why? Because he's built on sand. We want to be a church that has our whole self-identity built on rock, the rock of the gospel. That's what this team, this ministry, ministry leadership turn team, has as its single only agenda. 
those words of Paul to the, the, uh, uh, the no, sorry, the Sephaniah, the words of the Lord to Sephaniah to the people of his day, don't say our silver and our gold will save us, because your silver and your gold aren't going to save you. Other scriptures say, don't rely on your horse or your Mercedes. Don't rely on anything you've got, because those things are not going to save you. We live in a day of insurance policies, of DBS safeties and che checks, of uh, health policies, of safeguarding policies. All these things are good and proper, but actually in the day of the Lord, when the waters come, they don't save us. They don't. Human temptation is to say, peace and safety, all is well. But no, spiritual preparation is needed for that day of the Lord. Okay, so far, so good. So how do we prepare? How do we prepare? How do we remain in a state of readiness for the time, the hour of trial, when it comes, because come it will. come back to where I started. We need to know who we are, who we are already, and we need to own that. We are children of God, my friends, ransomed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. However bad the crisis may be, to survive it, we have to know who we are in Christ. Yeah, police, A and E people, soldiers, they all put on their uniforms to remind them who they are when the time of trial comes. Yeah? Because that's their job description. To hold the people when the EDL marches through Luton, the police have to have all their kit on and be ready. That's what was happening yesterday. And some of you will already be thinking of um, the verse we read earlier, 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But since we belong to the day, children of the light, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. We intentionally, consciously put on the breastplate of faith, the helmet of salvation. And... Paul goes further when writing to the Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse 13. Look it up when you go home, the whole chapter. He says, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, he doesn't say if it comes, when it comes, because come it will, so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, and then he goes on to list all the items that a Roman soldier of his day would have to be ready for the day of trial when it comes. Now, I'm a human being. I'm every bit as much a human being as each and every one of you, and if you haven't spotted that by now, then you must be blind. So when the hour of trial comes, some of us, and maybe you, really are looking for the place where you can hide. Where is that group of friends, your little tribe, your little group, to which you can escape? When we do that, when we escape to our little own in-group, who people who all agree with us, we lose the bigger picture of the whole community. If the whole community is hurting and in trial, and the waters are rising up all around us all the time, then God wants us to have a heart for the whole and not just our little bit. So let's beware of hiding in our own in group. A second completely human response is, let me out of this, please, God. There's a lot of empty chairs around us. 
Let me out of this. Let me out of this church. Let me out of this orchestra, I often used to think. Let me out of this football team. Let me out of this classroom. Let me out of it. I want to change my wife. Don't tell Margaret that. I don't know what she wants to do. You see what I mean? Things aren't going well. Change the wife. Yeah? Consumerism. Change the church. Let me out of this. Natural human response. Thirdly, who can I blame? Who can I blame for what is happening? It is entirely human to look for somebody to blame. Completely normal, natural human response. And in, that spreads around the community in murmurings and gossip. Do you remember the, the Israelites in the wilderness? Moses is trying to lead them into a better place, but they're murmuring and muttering and say, oh, Moses, Moses, you're just leading us into a state that's ever worse even worse than when we were back as slaves in Egypt. Who can we blame? And as Paul wrote to the Ephesians at same chapter 6, our faith, our faith is not, a, our, sorry, our fight, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the dark, forces of this cosmos yeah so when you feel tempted to blame somebody or some group of people for the way things are just remember that our struggle our battle our fight is actually not against individual people but it's against the dark forces at large in this universe the unseen forces of evil Resist the temptation to blame. Resist the temptation to hide. And resist the temptation to simply get out of it and change, get the hell out of it. Yeah? We need to be like those policemen on those horses yesterday. I'm sure the horse wanted, horses wanted to go. I'm sure the police wanted to go. But they had to stay there, leading the demonstration forward and keeping the peace and that's what our job is. Yeah? So to ask the question then of yourself, as a child of the light, how can I remain a child of the light? How can I continue to be what God has told me I am a child of the light? How can I be part of the solution rather than become part of a problem that we don't want to have? And here, I think our gospel reading for this morning that our economist, Dean, read for us, is helpful. It's all about money, management of credit. You and I, all of us have been given at least one bag of gold entrusted to us by the Lord God Almighty. This means a whole load to me, this passage, <clears throat> this story, this parable. Because just before I got ordained, <clears throat> I went into a little church in Newcastle, and I was about to play my last performance with Scottish opera in uh, that town, knowing I was then going off to be ordained and trained and all that. And as I was sitting alone in that church, I saw my dead brother, Stephen, who died when I was 13. He was age 15 at the time. And I, as I prayed, I saw him come to me with a gold key in his hand. And he came to me and he gave it to me. And I felt the gold go through my whole body. And then he disappeared. But I felt the message was very clear. Martin, you are to do in your life now what Stephen, your brother, didn't live to do. To, be, to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to them. And now, 23 years later, age 63, coming up to my retirement, I have to ask the question, what have I done with my gold key? 
Have I been a help to people? Have I made, made it worse? It's the right question to ask. How have I invested the gold that was entrusted to me? How have I made more of it? Have I been focused on the right things? The things of the kingdom of God? Is the world becoming a better place or a worse place because of me? I want to go on asking that question until I, as long as I have breath in me. Because in the parable, the command is take your pound of gold and your bag of gold and make something of it. Don't hide it in the bank or in the ground. Do something with it. Like those who had given two bags or five bags made something of it. And now that's not just for vicars, by the way. <laughs> this is for everybody. Everybody has been given a measure of gold. And you shine with that gold because you're a child of the light. You shine with that gold. What are you doing with it? message to the Thessalonican church is also this, as we heard in the reading, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands. I found that easy to do when I played the clarinet, work with my hands, but I'm not sure how good I am at minding my own business and leading a quiet life. I do get into a lot of trouble. I should make it my ambition to lead a quiet life. Then he goes on in verse 12, this is chapter 4, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anyone. We lead a quiet life, minding our own business, and as he says earlier, being awake and sober. Children of the light are awake and sober, not sleeping. Like a pregnant woman who is waiting for the hour when the child will come. The nurses and doctors never know, do they, when it's going to be. They try to pin it down to a day. They never know when it's going to come. But mother is waiting and a good husband is waiting. When is this child going to come? When is the pain going to begin? Because the pain is going to come. The day of the Lord is going to come and it's going to snatch you unawares like a thief in the night, the gospel tells us, unless we are prepared as children of the light, walking as children of the light, we need to be ready. Have the bag packed with the nappies and the dummies and the wipes and all the things that mothers have ready, and the cot at home ready, never mind about blue or pink, but, you know, being ready. This is the imagery of the Scriptures. You see, people in church life want programs. And then they want points of action. So members of the ministry leadership team are, Martin, are saying to me, Martin, what is this all about? What are we doing here? When are you going to give us the agenda and the list of things we're supposed to do or think about and plan for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? My answer is this. The agenda is to be sober and watch and wait for the day of the Lord, the day of trial, when it will come. That's enough of an agenda. To be silent before the sovereign Lord was the first words of the readings we heard today. To be silent before the sovereign Lord for the day of the Lord is near. So we finish by coming back to Gethsemane. 
Jesus know, knew that the hour of wrath was coming when he will be arrested, taken away, put on trial, tortured, crucified, laid in a tomb. He knew it was coming. What did he do to prepare? Went into the garden to pray. What happened to Peter, James, and John? They went, fell asleep down there. They couldn't stay awake. They probably wondered, what, what's he doing now, Jesus? What are you doing now? When's the next battle plan for the advance of your kingdom on earth? You're the king. Tell us the marching orders. Jesus simply prayed, sweating blood. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying plans and things are uh, important, aren't important. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying to you that my last eight months here with you will be about spiritual preparation. And it will be my successor to ask, answer the questions, what are we going to do? How are we going to express that? Do you see? Is that enough? I think it is enough, my friends. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs>